have the privilege this morning of beginning our time of worship with a baby dedication, which you recognize is not really just a baby dedication. It's more like a parent dedication as well. So Chaz and Becky Palmer, if you would come, and uh, we want them to introduce the star of the show for just a moment. This is Sawyer Remington Palmer, and he is dressed to preach this morning. But don't cry, because I've done this a couple of times before. What a cutie, huh? So we have the opportunity to walk through kind of a dedication time with mom and dad here. And so to the two of you, let me simply ask, are you willing as followers of Jesus to always emphasize the truth of the Bible in your home? And are you willing as followers of Jesus to emphasize the reality that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life? And are you willing to continually worship with a church family and then to train him in such a way that he too will have the opportunity to hear about the Lord Jesus, not only at church, but also in your home. All right, church family, I'm going to invite you to recite a covenant with us together this morning. And so would you just simply say this along with me if this is the desire of your heart. We pledge to maintain faithfulness to the Scripture and always ensure that the gospel of Jesus is proclaimed from our church's pulpit taught in our church's classrooms, and lived out in our homes. We covenant together as part of this community of faith to honor the Lord Jesus so that the children in our midst will learn to honor Him with the life they've been given. We covenant together to conduct ourselves as a local church with integrity and strive to never be a stumbling block to these little ones the Lord Jesus entrusts to us. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to this very special time, we want to pray that in a very significant way that you will bless this family. We thank you, Father, for Sawyer. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in the lives of his family. We pray, Father, that at the appropriate time, as he's had the opportunity to learn about Jesus, that he'll come to a saving knowledge and present himself to the Lord Jesus to be saved. Father, we thank you for the gift of this family. We pray your blessings upon them and upon this little one. We pray in Jesus' name. And he said, amen. All right, thank you. We want to take this opportunity to welcome you to worship today. And if you're a guest with the First Baptist Church family, there's some information that uh, we'll call your attention to on the screen. We simply would invite you to fill out a connection card and place that in the offering plate a little bit later in the service. But we want to have the opportunity to get acquainted, so let's take just a few moments and stand together and welcome. turn to pray from the mountains to the valleys hear our praises rise to you from the heavens to the nations hear our sing Fill the air 
amazing grace wonderful beautiful amazing grace marvelous glorious amazing grace wonderful beautiful amazing grace marvelous glorious amazing grace wonderful beautiful amazing grace grace just sung a song about grace because I need you to extend me some grace. I was so enamored with the fact that Sawyer didn't cry while I was hanging on to him that I forgot to give his mom and dad the flower and the Bible. So when he grows up, you can tell everybody the pastor had to ask for his forgiveness on the Sunday morning he was dedicated.
hearts on high, oh let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us go in this world where we roam. Ancient words will guide us. pray together. Father, collectively, we offer our thanksgiving for your goodness to us, for your grace toward us, made possible through the shed blood of Jesus. And then, Father, we thank you for the great gift of your ancient words toward us. We thank you, Father, for the sacred scripture and for the opportunity we have to learn more of your heart and to learn how we're to conduct ourselves and how we're to live, how we're to be forgiven and how we're to walk in grace and freedom. Father, I would pray that as we now look into your word and take this time in our worship to study together, Father, I pray that the ancient words that you imparted to writers many, many years ago, even today, Lord, as they are continually inspiring us and they are inspired words, God, I pray that we would be drawn close to you, that we would magnify Jesus, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. 
Have you ever had a moment like minding your own business, kind of doing your own thing, so to speak, and somebody asked you a question? I'm not talking about just kind of a run-of-the-mill sort of question. I mean a question that is a little more personal. I don't mean did they ask you what time is it or did they ask you for some directions to a particular destination. Have you ever had a moment in time when somebody just turned and said to you, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? In fact, think this through with me for a moment. If you would be asked that question, who is Jesus, how would you respond? Would you have an answer ready? What would you say? Would you know what to say? Would you respond honestly? Or, as so many in our culture today choose to do, would you couch your response in politically correct language so as not to offend anybody. Who is Jesus? At the very beginning of Matthew's Gospel, he establishes three things about Jesus that we're going to look at, and they will help us understand and then ultimately articulate who Jesus really is. One of the sad things about life today is that for all of our technological advances and all of the ability that we have to document and process information, generally speaking, we don't do nearly as good a job of passing along our heritage as generations before us have done. Most of us know some things about our parents. Most of us know some things about our grandparents. But beyond that, probably not a whole lot is known about our heritage. I know some things about my parents. I know a lot about my parents. I know a few things about my grandparents. I'm sure less than I knew about my parents. And I know very little about my great-grandparents. In fact, unless I would reference the sheet upon which their names were written, I wouldn't be able to call their names off the top of my head. Matthew chapter 1 gives us a list of people in the family tree of Jesus. Now, I know what you're thinking. Great. This is wonderful. It's, it's the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and the pastor has chosen to preach on what many people would say would be the most boring text in all of Scripture. Well, it's not. Normally, we know how this works. When we come to a genealogy or a family tree of somebody in Scripture, typically we are faced with a great temptation, and the temptation is to gloss over those names to get to the good stuff. We want to move ahead. We think, for example, it's just a list of names. But listen to me, it's not. It is not just a list of names. These are people that are very important to your heritage and my heritage because they were and are very important to the heritage of the very Son of God Himself. We've been in a series preaching through the Gospel of Matthew, and I intentionally waited to deal with chapters 1 and 2 because I didn't want to preach on Christmas. And then, anyway, we're going to deal with Christmas now. So Matthew chapter 1 And today's message is titled, A New Genesis. If you have your Bible, let's turn together to Matthew chapter 1, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. And I invite you to stand to show honor to the Lord for His Word to us. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. 
And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Elihud, and Elihud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Thank you so much. You may be seated. A new Genesis. In the Greek language, the word genealogy can be rendered Genesis. With Jesus, essentially we recognize we have a new Genesis, a new beginning. As awesome as the very first beginning actually was, we now see God through Christ affecting all of his creation with the grace that is ultimately poured out and given through the Lord Jesus. So we think about the very first book of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis or the book of beginnings, and we think that first book of the Old Testament certainly is a book of beginnings, but now let's take some time and think about the very first book of the New Testament as being a book of new beginnings, a new Genesis the book of the genealogy, Biblos, Geneseos, literally the book of the Genesis, the beginning. This is the book about Christ. Matthew 1.1 mentions Jesus, and it begs the question then, who is Jesus? This is very important. There are countless people, especially in today's culture that is becoming more and more anti-Christian and anti-Christ, there are more and more people who are accusing Christians of making Jesus into something he's not. Let me be very clear. We did not simply come up with an obscure figure from antiquity and choose to worship him. No, there are verifiable reasons as to why we recognize that Jesus is God in the flesh. So who is this Jesus? Well, there are three things that I want to say in answer to that, and then we're going to deal with three larger issues from the text itself. So first of all, he is the Messiah, that is, he is the Christ. The word Messiah means the anointed one and speaks both of Jesus' role and Jesus' purpose. You remember back in 1999, just as we prepared to move into the year 2000, all of the things that were swirling about the millennium. At the turn of the millennium, around the time in which Jesus was born, messianic expectations were at fever pitch. People were looking for the Messiah to come. They were looking for the one who would eradicate the rule of Rome and from that reestablish Israel to her former glory. Jesus was and is Messiah, but not that kind of Messiah necessarily. As God stepped out of the splendor of heaven and stepped into our broken world, he provided salvation for us through Jesus. He taught, he modeled. In fact, Jesus died our deaths so that we might live his life. He suffered vicariously for us that we don't have to be separated from God throughout all of eternity. So he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the anointed one, but also he is a descendant of David. You remember from history that David is regarded as the greatest king in all of Israel. The covenant that God made with David was that he would maintain a line of successors from David's life going forward, and this he did. Jesus is then tied inextricably to David. His royal lineage speaks of his reign. The demands of his rule are rightful. He is able to make the very claims that he made. You may recall C.S. Lewis who famously said that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. And for some 2,000 years, believers in Christ have said together in unison with one voice, Jesus is Lord. Would you say that with me? Jesus is 
Lord. And we believe that with all of our hearts, and that's why we're here. And then thirdly, he is a descendant of Abraham. Abraham being the non-Jewish founder of the Israelite race, the covenant that God made with Abraham was that he would be blessed in order to in turn bless the rest of the world. That's a great picture, isn't it? Abraham and those who would follow him would be blessed so that they might bless the rest of the world. Genesis chapter 17, verse 4, if you take notes, also chapter 18, verse 18, and also chapter 21, verse 18, Israel was blessed to be a blessing, not just to one another, but rather to the entire world. So these references to Messiah, to David, to Abraham, help us understand that Jesus came from God to rule over us so that in the ultimate sense, we as his children, we as his people might in turn be a blessing to the world. So there are three thoughts in terms of application related to this that I want to give you based on those three things that we noted just a moment ago. First of all, we have to be very clear in our understanding of who Jesus is. If we're not clear on Jesus, if we don't understand, and if we're not able to understand it and articulate it and then live it out, if we're not clear on who Jesus is, then the reality is nothing else matters. If we don't get this right then all of our finery and all of the trappings of our faith and our religion are for naught. We need to know and be able to articulate who Jesus is. But we have to be able not only to know him, but articulate our understanding of Jesus. 1 Peter 3.15, the Apostle Peter writes as follows, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you, for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So if you're asked, who is Jesus, be ready to say who he is. And then we have to be prepared to live in light of our understanding of Jesus. In other words, it's not just enough to know about him. It's not even just enough to be able to talk about it. We have to live it practically in our day-to-day -day experience as followers of Christ. If I know it and articulate it but don't live it, how can I really say I believe it? And yet you know, as well as I do, there are countless people in our nation that, even as we noted last week, some 75 percent of Americans claim to be Christian? Really? If, if that's true, if there are that many believers, then there ought to be more of us living to follow Christ. Amen? Okay, pastor, so it's almost Christmas. This is the weekend after Thanksgiving. So before our eyes glaze over while you talk about the genealogy, what's the point in studying? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> genealogy and the genealogy in particular of Jesus is important for three reasons at least. Number one, the genealogy reveals that Jesus came from the right line. Say right line with me. Right line. The genealogy claims that Jesus reveals that Jesus came from the right line. Matthew's goal was to provide proof that Jesus is the rightful heir on at least two promises. 2 Samuel chapter 7, if you'll turn with me there for just a moment, I think it might appear on the screen as well, but 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 and 13 Listen to what the Scripture says. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, this is God speaking, by the way, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God's promise. God's promise is was that he would be faithful to continue David's royal line how long? forever. His kingdom will never end. And then Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Turn with me there for just a moment. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And this is vitally important, not only as we deal with the genealogy of Jesus, but also it's vitally important in terms of our understanding for some things that are taking place in our world at this very moment. Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, 
Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Now here's the key. Listen carefully. God says to Abram, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will, say the word with me, curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you want to know why it's such a big deal that America treats Israel with honor and respect? Well, there it is, sports fans. The reason that so many evangelical Christians continue to make a big issue about how the people of America treat the people of Israel, there it is. That's the rationale. God's promise to Abraham was that he would bless him so that he would bless the world. And then these two promises come together and they are ultimately fulfilled in none other than, guess who? Jesus. Matthew demonstrates Jesus' messiahship. Messiah had to be a Jew. Look with me at verse 1, or verse 2 of chapter 1. Abraham was the father of Isaac. He has to be the son of Abraham. He's going to be a Jew. Messiah then had to be from the tribe of Judah. Matthew chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as well as Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10. He had to be from the tribe of Judah. Had to be a Jew, had to be from the tribe of Judah. But then the Messiah had to be from one specific member of the tribe of Judah, Matthew chapter 1, verse 6. And as we read all of those things, we begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together and we recognize that Jesus is the match. He is the Messiah. But, interestingly enough, Jesus wasn't the only one in history to have such a lineage. So, for example, his four brothers... In Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, they're listed, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Also, another one who, who many would say would share that lineage would be the great famous Rabbi Hillel. But as we will see together next week, there is a tremendous twist in the story that makes Jesus, and hear me clearly, it makes Jesus the only possible candidate to be the Messiah. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Let's skip ahead and look at it with me. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God. Jesus is God with us. And therein lies the difference in who Jesus is, compared to who anybody else in the world ever has been or ever could be. And then Matthew 18, verse 20, and Matthew 28, verse 20, Matthew stresses that Jesus is the presence of God in the world while being the fleshly embodiment of deity. Jesus is God. He's God in the flesh. Colossians 2.9 is a fitting summary of Matthew 1.23 where Paul writes in Colossians 2.9, For in him, that is Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In Charles Spurgeon's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, the great preacher stops at this text and he writes, Marvelous condescension. It's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? Marvelous condescension that God should be a man and have a genealogy, even he who was in the beginning with God and thought it not robbery to be equal to God. Marvelous condescension. Rightly so, we think it's a big deal when some famous person, someone of education or someone of means, goes the extra mile in helping those who might be less fortunate. We get a big kick out of it. For example, when an athlete, someone famous of good reputation, goes into an inner city area and puts on clinics for the poor and underprivileged, that's a big deal, and we make a big deal of it. When Mother Teresa lived and began her Sisters of Mercy that helped the poorest of the poor, we thought that's a big deal because that's humility, that is condescension. But nothing, hear me clearly, nothing compares to the condescension that God experienced when he became man. Marvelous condescension, wrote Spurgeon. When we read the words, the book 
of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And then we read Matthew 1, 23, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, that is God with us. We as the people of God above all ought to be moved to praise, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. The genealogy reveals that Jesus came from the right line. Say right line with me. Right line. Number two, I want you to recognize the genealogy reveals that Jesus came at the right time. Say right time. Right time. There is purpose as to why Matthew structures the genealogy of Jesus the way that he does. There has long been a lot of debate and some disagreement related to why Matthew structures this, why he does. Some have said, for example, that the number 14 is a literary device called a gematria. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, each letter has a numerical value. So, for example, Aleph is the very first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, like our letter A. Aleph counts for how many points? One point, okay? Dalet is the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Fourth letter, so the word, or the letter Dalet counts for how many points? Four points. Vav is the sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, so the word, or the letter Vav counts for how many points? By the way, if you're interested in learning Hebrew, I was a, I was a music major at the time that I was going through learning Hebrew in seminary, and all of the preachers in the class were having difficulty with it, and one day it just came to me, this is, this is good stuff right here, okay? And I began to hum. You can learn the Hebrew alphabet if you hum the tune, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's been 20 some odd years. Anyway, <laughs> see what happens when I move off script? The word, now this is the important part, the word David, and remember we're talking about the significance of David, the word David in Hebrew is comprised of three letters, dalet, vav, dalet, dalet, vav, dalet, four, six, four, which equals how many? Fourteen. So some have said Matthew is reminding us prosaically as well as poetically what we said just a little bit ago, Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is Lord. Frederick Dale Bruner suggests that we think of the history here like the capital letter N, that is the 14th letter of our alphabet. The first, as you read this, the first 14 generations head upward from Abraham to David. The second 14 downward from Solomon to the Babylonian exile. The final 14 move upward again in hope and fulfillment from the exile to the Christ. So three important transitions in Israel are covered here. Matthew 1.17 states, all those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. This statement covers three important transitions in Israel's history. David to Abraham spans the rise of the nation from its formation to its height. David to the Babylonian exile is a description of the demise of the nation. And then from the exile to the Messiah expression, the return of the nation to God. Galatians 4.4 says that in the fullness of time, God sent his son Make no mistake about this, my brothers and sisters. Jesus came into the world at precisely the right time. So, the genealogy reveals that Jesus came from the right line. The genealogy reveals that Jesus came at the right time. And thirdly and finally, the genealogy reveals that Jesus came as God's right design. Matthew's genealogy is, quite frankly, a bit peculiar. Providing a genealogy, you recognize, if you know much about history, is a very Jewish thing to do. But if you read the list of names, you're going to find there are some some unbelievably unique features in play here. The genealogy includes the mention of five women, four of whom were Gentiles. Three of the women, Rahab, Tamar, and Bathsheba, were noted not for their ability to have hospitality, not for their cooking ability, not for their beauty, but they were noted above all for their sexual sin. Now, we wouldn't put that in our genealogy. 
I mean, if we were going to try to, to trace a genealogy today, and let's say, for example, we were somehow related to a scoundrel from, you know, antiquity, we would sort of desire to put that skeleton back in the closet, amen? But the Bible doesn't do that. And I think that's for good reason. If you read the stories of each male in the list, you'll also see that each of them had their personal sin issues. This genealogy would have offended, greatly offended, any Pharisaical Jew who valued racial, moral, and patriarchal purity. Here's the point. Matthew was writing, we know, to a Jewish audience. But from the very start of his gospel, he wanted his audience, he wanted those who heard this read, and he wanted those who might read it to know that the gospel of Jesus, get this, the gospel is inclusive. All are welcome, everybody is welcome to find grace and forgiveness through this Messiah who has come. Don't miss the faith factor in all of this. While I've given what Matthew gives as convincing proofs that Jesus is Messiah, if someone is inclined not to believe or if they are prone to unbelief, I recognize that what I'm talking about likely won't change their minds. Don't forget, for all of our proofs, for all of the effort that we put into apologetics, and rightfully so, all of our history, all that we have that points to Jesus being the Christ, belief takes faith. Faith involves faith. I know that's a poor definition, but it's reality. Carl Sagan, the brilliant man, but the foolish man, once said he would believe, if, he would believe in God if God had written the Ten Commandments on the moon. Well, it's likely that most would have believed in God if God had written the Ten Commandments on the moon, but that would take the faith out of faith. And taking the faith out of faith is like removing the oxygen from the air or taking away the mystery of the romance. There's something beautiful that cannot be fully explained. It's faith. So what's the point in the way all this is put together? I know you've been following the events in Ferguson, Missouri. And with all due respect, I need to say a couple of things about that. Al Sharpton does not have the answer. Or if he does, he's not sharing it. Jesse Jackson doesn't have the answer. Or if he does, he's not sharing it. President Obama and Governor Nixon, with all due respect, they either do not have the answer or they're not sharing it. If you had the answer, for what would change the face of a culture, what would change the lives of countless people in a community, in a state, in a nation, in a world, if you had the answer and you were given the very public platform to share that answer, would you not share it? They don't have the answer. Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, President Obama, Governor Nixon, they don't have the answer, but I do. I do. You say, you're kind of arrogant this morning. Well, I'm arrogant most mornings. <laughs> you have the answer too. We collectively, as the people of God, the people of Jesus, we have the answer. Listen to me carefully. The connection between this genealogy and our world today is so very obvious, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, but you know how it works. That which is obvious is oftentimes missed. As you read the genealogy, listen to me carefully, Jesus didn't come from white, middle-class, respectable stock. He belonged to a family of murderers, cheats, cowards, adulterers, and liars. And that was very purposeful. Matthew wants to show what Paul will later teach in 1 Timothy 1.15, where he writes, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. Jesus didn't come just for the righteous. That ought to make a Baptist shout. <laughs> Jesus came for the unrighteous, chapter 9, verse 13. He came for sinners. He came from men like Matthew, the tax collector, like Rahab, the prostitute, like Tamar, the seductress, like Bathsheba, the wife, of, the wife of Uriah, who was, in fact, the adulteress. Jesus came for you and for me. 
and he came for everybody in Ferguson and in Missouri and the United States and the world. So the genealogy reveals that Jesus came from the right line. The genealogy reveals that Jesus came at the right time. The genealogy reveals that Jesus came as God's right design. I don't think Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, President Obama, or Governor Nixon are offering the right answer. No, I know at some level, some, some of them are trying. But in fact, I submit to you, it's distressing. It is distressing to listen to these and others who claim to be men of faith missing the mark by so very much. Now, please understand me. I understand that it is not the governor's role to be the chief evangelist in the state of Missouri, nor is it the president's role to be the chief evangelist in the United States. But if you know the answer, you ought to share it. You know the answer. You, as the people of God, know the answer. The answer to crime, the answer to all sin, the answer to prejudice, the answer to all sides of racism, the answer is Jesus. And to demonstrate that, he came from the right line at the right time to reveal God's right design. shaking let hearts awaken our god is moving forever changing lives there is a trembling there is revival the sound of worship so great and glorious
Thank you so much for being with us today in worship. We are so glad that you took the opportunity to follow along, to worship with us, and to join us in this experience as we lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. Let me encourage you, if you don't have a regular church home, a place where you're plugged in and you have the opportunity to go in and be involved in ministry, we would encourage you, we would invite you. We want you to come and be a part of this First Baptist Church family. We're not perfect, but we serve a God who is perfect. And I want you to know, Jesus loves you. You're invited to come and be a part of things here. We look forward to seeing you. God bless you.